very good afternoon everyone so i welcome you all for this uh, uh, ieee uh, grss and ap mtt joint chapter and uh, geomatics expert program session so we have with us professor mata she is a professor of electrical engineering at the university of south california uh, who is associated with the department of electrical engineering Uh, she received the phd degree in electrical and computer engineering from university of illinois urbana uh, and during her past 25 years of active involvement in environmental remote sensing dr mata has introduced new approaches for quantitative interpretation of synthetic aperture radar and her most recent contributions includes the development of new radar uh measurement technologies for subsurface and subcanopy characterization development of forward and inverse scattering techniques for layered random media with rough surface in, uh, interfaces developing sensor web technologies for in situ environmental sensing and transforming concepts of radar remote sensing to high resolution medical engineering so she is also a member of the uh, nasa soil moisture active and passive uh, mission science team uh and there's there's lots more that i can talk about her but i'll not take much time as we have only an hour in hand and i'd like to invite her for her session please thank you very much for the kind it's uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here i truly I uh, appreciate the opportunity I especially thank uh, my host Dr. Shib Mohan who has been instrumental in arranging for this and guiding me through this whole process uh, and so I I do really appreciate it and I'm I apologize in advance that the time is so short and here uh, basically just half a day <laughs> with an approximation <laughs> uh, but I uh, I'm already enjoyed it enjoying it quite a bit and hope to uh, be back to have more chances for interaction with you all So uh, let me start. So uh, the title of my talk is um, "Microwave Sensing Through the Subsurface for Addressing the Water Puzzle." Uh, this is a compilation of several different um, pieces of work that I and my group have been working on. You guys hearing are hearing the echo. I think uh, it, you're, you're okay. <laughs> Does that work okay? Is the sound okay? Uh, so yes, uh, we've been working on this topic for quite a few years, and I would especially like to acknowledge my wonderful group members, some of whom I have uh, uh, listed here. So these are my PhD students, postdocs, and research group members who have contributed to this work over the years. Uh, let me. I mean, the, the title of my talk is focused on water. Let's think about water, and let's give you some facts about water. Of course, uh, the biggest thing is that we need water. But besides that, you know, it's pretty startling to think that even though we are the blue planet, 70% of the Earth is covered with water. Only two and a half percent of water on the Earth is fresh water, and that is what we need to live on. approximation but of that 2.5% 68.7% roughly are in locked up in great glaciers and they're in snow and ice caps okay and as i mentioned already the glaciers are melting disappearing so that that part of the fresh water may be disappearing to some extent 30.1% of the fresh water is in the ground ground water so that's a pretty good amount of uh, relatively speaking that's a good chunk of water about 1.2% is in surface water and i say surface water meaning lakes and rivers 
and then the water contained in the of mentioning fresh water, that's probably what you think about, lakes and rivers, right? However, they're tiny bit. There's only 1.2% of the 2.5%. So we're talking about 0.0% of the entire uh, supply of water globally is in the uh, lakes and rivers. And then even smaller amount of that, tiny bit of that locked up in the soil. And which is what, is what we call soil moisture. And soil moisture goes from the surface down to before we reach uh, the groundwater stores. So uh, one thing, however, what one um, point I want to make about surface water, and in particular soil moisture, is that even though it's such a small fraction of the total fresh water um, stores, it's very, very important. It's hugely important because it controls the exchange of water and energy between the ground and the atmosphere. So a lot of the climate effects that we are observing uh, that have to do with the cycling of water are controlled by soil moisture. So again, even are controlled to a very large So uh, thinking about what we use fresh water for, by far, by far, the largest portion of the fresh water uh, stores are used by agriculture around the world. India is a great example. The US is a great example. Uh, the numbers vary, but roughly about 80% of the freshwater usage around the world is by agriculture. And I would venture, and this is only my own, only my own quote, maybe not uh, uh, everybody else's quote, we waste a lot of water uh, in agriculture. Not because we waste food, we need to use water on agriculture. However, the way we use the water is wasteful. So that's one of the areas that you know, what our technologies eventually are uh, going to be very, uh, very helpful to help this. Several highly populated areas are impacted. India is a uh, western coast of South Africa, Australia, the Arabian Peninsula, Middle East uh, in general. That's, you know, these are very highly populated but very much um, impacted by water scarcity. In the US, intelligence community actually has flagged water as one of So what do we do? I mean, what, so what? What, what? what is our uh, role? What's the plan here? The first thing to observe is that reliable ways of quantifying and characterizing water uh, are still um, not available. We are, we are still way behind in having a very consistent, accurate method for um, characterizing or quantifying uh, water, especially the water that's locked up in the ground. Whether it's the soil moisture or it's the groundwater, these are, these are the issues that are, we are still struggling with. And uh, th so the techniques, the technical uh, aspect is poorly developed, even though you know, we're working on it, but they're still needing a lot of work. However, the good thing, and you know, this brings us to the topic of this talk, is that a lot of our technologies having to do with microwave remote sensing are very strong, are, are very powerful in addressing this problem in terms of giving us the chance to uh, characterize water, track water, look at the dynamics, as well as the stores. Why is that? Uh, so I know that you know if you guys have you know, wonderful, brilliant students working the, in uh, geomatics and uh, civil engineering areas, uh, so you're familiar with uh, uh, the basic premise uh, of this probably that microwaves, and by microwaves I mean radio frequencies or the frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum, which are you know between. Uh, you know, a few megahertz, tens of megahertz up to a few gigahertz of frequency, these signals are primarily sensitive to the presence of water. So that's a blessing for us because now we have a very good way of uh, characterizing or quantifying water because the signal, signals we use to study the environment, they are primarily sensitive to water. If you think about the main pieces of this global freshwater puzzle uh, that I was uh, painting for you here, the, the big pieces that um, we would like to characterize are snow water equivalent, because the, uh, remember that glacier snow and ice caps, those are the, the biggest stores of fresh water. Uh, 
and snow water equivalent, so how much water there is in, in snow, that's one of the biggest unknowns. Glaciers, you could basically eyeball them and look, look at the volume and estimate how much water they might contain. Snow is very difficult to quantify the water content. The other one is soil moisture. So how much water there is in soil from the surface to what we call the root zone, so, so going down to tens of centimeters, and groundwater. So these are the major uh, pieces of puzzle we don't know. And if you think about it, we go from the top of the surface to the ground to the subsurface. Right? So what we need to do is to use microwave frequencies which progressively allow us to measure uh, phenomena beneath the surface. And if, uh, if you've taken some basic physics courses, you might know or might remember that to penetrate through objects using microwave frequencies, you need lower frequencies or longer wavelengths. Basically, the, the penetration depth of the microwave signals is proportional to the wavelength. It also depends on how much water content there is. Uh, but in, uh, the, the most important thing is how long the wavelength is or how low the frequency is. The lower the frequency, the longer or the, the deeper the, the penetration. And of course, unfortunately, is the difficulty of detection also because uh, you know, we don't have access to the subsurface. So it, it becomes technologically and also computationally more and more difficult to analyze the signals that are uh, coming back to us from the subsurface. So some of the very popular sensors, which you are probably familiar with, these are active, what we call active microwave sensors or radars. And these, these are the instruments where have their own source of illumination, microwave illumination. So we have a source like an antenna that uh, transmits the, the signals towards the target on the surface of the Earth. The, the signals interact with that target and come back. And we look at the echo, measure the echo, and from that, uh, then we try to um, quantify the unknowns with water. So synthetic aperture radars or SARS, those are um, uh, some of the most popular sensors. Uh, radars are, if you have ever worked with radars, you know that they're notoriously tough and expensive to, to build. They're complex systems, and they're uh, also pretty expensive to build. So, so here in this talk, I'm going to focus on soil moisture and groundwater. Uh, snow water equivalent, that's also a very interesting and very tough area of, uh, of research, but we're not going to, uh, to tackle that today. So just soil moisture and groundwater. Now I wanted to make one other comment here uh, regarding this last bullet, that radars are notoriously expensive and difficult to build. There is a, a new, uh, new set of technologies, and I'm going to mention just this chart, I'm not going to focus on this topic so much, but I wanted to bring this up because I find it quite, uh, uh, quite powerful, is that instead of using the traditional radars that have their own transmitters, uh, there's a whole class of new technologies coming online now which are called the signals of opportunity. So instead of having one satellite dedicated to active microwave sensing or radars with its own transmitter, we use some other existing transmitter which we call the signal of opportunity or so up this like soup, but so up. Uh, again, that's kind of a new class of technologies. For example, GPS signals, which are ever present, they're all the time, we use them for navigation, but now we are trying to use them for radar applications because we take the uh, GPS signals, they get reflected, and from the reflection, we can form images which resemble radar images. So I've listed some uh, other possibilities, GPS, FM radio, your Wi-Fi signal, military communication satellites in the US, and so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, the question is, can we augment the, the remote sensor, the traditional ones with these slow ops? And the answer is uh, yes. So just to keep this in mind, I, if there's time, I might come back to it at the end of the talk and say a little bit more. But this becomes part of the larger uh, sensing scenario or the operational scenario that we envision having uh, the next few years, the next couple of decades going forward. So for you guys, I'm trying to or you're starting out your careers, uh, potentially in remote sensing and using microwave technologies. Uh, this is a scenario that I find pretty appealing, which contain our standards, uh, this Cadillac version of remote sensing devices, uh, active and passive. We could have the signals of opportunity, radars. We could have GPS and different kinds of uh, transmitters, which allow us to look at reflected signals. We can have networks of UAVs on manned aerial vehicles with smaller radars that we can deploy on demand. And then we have in situ sensors that provide us with ground truth data. So ultimately, 
my belief is that we need all of this as uh, some kind of an integrated observational scenario as we go uh, forward to, to address this uh, water. And not just water. In, in general, remote sensing of the environment, characterizing our environment, it's, we need uh, this kind of strategy. So let's do a quick crash course on radar in two charts. Uh, so let me ask you guys, have, uh, have you taken uh, courses in remote sensing or radars? Basic idea of uh, radar, does that, uh, does that sound familiar to you? When I say radar, I mean, traditionally, when I say radar, everyone imagines this computer, this, this blip, the computer screen, like the World War <laughs> II kind of thing, that, you know, there's one blip of the radar. I, actually, that's not too far from even the current concept of radar. The idea is to transmit and receive. Okay, so, uh, but for the environmental applications and what we call the imaging radars, so we have a transmitter. This could be a satellite looking onto the Earth. Okay, so let's say just your backyard, your, you know, uh, some agricultural speed or whatever your area of interest is. This gatherer interacts with the signal. It sends the signals to a receiver. Okay, now this receiver could be coincident at the same place as a transmitter, but in general it's not. It could be any location. Uh, and then there is uh, this equation here, which is called the radar equation, and that relates the received power to the transmitted power via a bunch of uh, parameters, uh, that are properties of the measurement system and of the, the scattering target. So everything here, so lambda, the wavelength, um, this is the gain of the antenna, that's the distance, A is the area of the scatterer, but this quantity, so even if you haven't seen this radar equation before, uh, really the, the take home message here is that the received power is equal to the transmitted power times a bunch of things. And th this bunch of things has as one of the central players in it, this is what we call the sigma naught, which is the scattering cross section of the target. This is what we try to measure. And then, once we have a measurement of that via our radar system, then we relate that to the quantities of interest, which is water content in the soil, could be vegetation, or whatever other parameters that are unknown that we are after. The way the radar works, if you look at the timing diagram, there's a transmit, so this thing transmits interacts with the target, uh, the target distributes or disperses the signal it's because it's, it's, not a, it's not a very focused location for the target, it's a distributed target. So even when it sees a nicely defined transmit, it could translate that into a smeared out received signal. And then so your radar keeps transmitting, it's a pulse, radars are pulsed systems, so they keep transmitting and, and receiving. And this is the, the received signal here is what we integrate to, uh, to define our uh, total received power. So uh, I mentioned that your transmit and receive could be uh, co-located or differently located. So this is the two scenarios. So let's say so if that's your satellite. Uh, if, you, if your transmit and receive are at the same location, so you send the pulse, so we receive the pulse. Uh, or if they're in different locations, so if we have the signals of opportunity. So let's say if this is your GPS transmitter, but here is your own receiver that you launched into space, or it could be an airborne receiver, actually. This is the scenario. But you see that you know, the, the main premise doesn't change. It's still that integral, the radar equation that governs the interaction between the transmit and receive. Uh, Terminology-wise, these systems we call monostatic. These we call bistatic. Like a monostatic meaning mono, just the Latin word, like means the same. Same transmit receive. Bistatic means two different locations for transmit and receive. So now what happens to uh, the signal um, as it interacts with the target? And this is the key in understanding how we use these signals to track things like soil moisture or groundwater and so forth. So, and here I have, uh, I don't think it wants me to update anything now, okay. So, so these two are pretty much the same picture. This is the monostatic case. Same location for transmit receive. This is the bistatic case, but the physics is again very much the same. So let's say that if you just traditional monostatic radar, you have a signal that comes in here, hits your target. So if this is again, this is the tree uh, landscape out there. So you have trees, you have a ground surface, and you have the subsurface in the ground. This is where the water is. What happens is that the signals interact with the vegetation canopy. Some of it gets, some of the signal gets through, hits the ground penetrates the ground, 
at interactions with all those ground layers, it could hit the trunks of the trees, hit the ground, and it have these multiple interactions that eventually it makes its way back to the receiver. Okay, same thing in this case. The thing is that you know, even though this hopefully makes sense from a, you know, just uh, your uh, scientific intuition, this would make sense, it turns out that this is a very complex set of interactions. So if you started from your basic set of Maxwell's equations with govern, which govern the electromagnetic waves, and you wanted to write down the, the received signal, it's a very, very tough, complicated task. You have, there's no closed form solution for it. You inevitably have to switch to computational methods, which is what we do. But the, but the bottom line is that it's possible. The physics of this is known. Uh, we do make approximations because we have to make the computations tractable. But uh, it, is, it is a known quantity. Okay. So uh, let's uh, make this assumption that we know how the physics works. We know how to formulate it. And then we can move on to make use of our knowledge. So what do we do? So I mentioned computational methods. When we do computations, uh, again, inevitably, we have to simplify things. Okay. A real tree is a very complicated creature. We have you know, very little hope, if any, to exactly model a real tree. So what do we do? We, we make a cartoon version of it, and this is exactly what we program. So we model the tree trunks with cylinders. The branches are cylinders, maybe shorter cylinders, but at some random angles. The leaves or needles also become little uh, targets. For the ground, um, we have multiple layers in the ground that we model. So each of these little pieces becomes a piece of the, uh, the model, this computation, or the numerical model that, uh, that we program. Okay? So, so the ground, you know, we can make it as complicated as you want. It could have you know, n layers, or n could be a very large number. And then, of course, you don't have just one tree. You have a scene which has numerous trees. So we define, we uh, basically uh, define the model of the scattering environment as a stochastic or statistical model. We say, let's say we have 10 trunks per resolution cell. We have, on, on average, let's say 100 branches per resolution cell. The angle, the or orientation angle of these branches is so and so uh, on the average per resolution cell. So those are, we, we come up with stochastic representations of these targets. And what that does is this. That, so it, let's say if your actual scene looks like that, so you have different kinds of trees. In terms of our model, the model doesn't really care how these different <coughs> components are distributed. In the eyes of the target, they could look like this or they could look like that. Like, so it's the same number of elements, same orientation, everything, except they're just distributed uniformly. It, this makes our computations a lot easier because then we don't have to worry about placing specifically each scatter in a given location. And then, uh, very notionally, you know, without even going through what each of these terms is, what happens is that this m, let's say m is my total received power, uh, consists of contribution from branches. So I've defined these little uh, subscripts. I don't know if you can see the fine print from back in the room. But B is branch, so you, you have the contribution from branches. You have the con contribution from the trunks, from the ground, so on and so forth. And then you see some of these terms have multiple terms in them. So for example, if you look at, oops, let me go forward. So let's say if you look at this second term here, uh, this subscript T, which is for trunks, and then it's multiplied by two other matrices or operators uh, so T stands for transmission. So you have to transmit the signal through the branches to get to the trunks. So this is an operator which, at the core, let's say, is the trunk. But then you have to go through the branches on the way in and on the way out. So that, that's how these terms are written. So again, computationally or mathematically, we put all of these terms together. We add up the total power based on the contribution of the, the different components. And that basically gives us the, the model of how or what we expect to receive if we have a radar signal incident on, on a very complex scene. Okay? And of course, we're not done yet. I mean, this model just gives us a prediction of what we are supposed to see. It doesn't tell us what the soil moisture was or how many branches there were. That's the next step. Okay? So, uh, 
So this one here, I just wanted to include, to give you a um, kind of an intuitive feel for what kind of relative signal strength we expect to see. So let's say if this is your tree, and I purposely am not showing the branches, but just to show you the, the main uh, interactions that are going on. So this is your incident wave. Okay. For your incident wave, so your radar is transmitting from this angle. You have a tree here, and you have a, a, a ground surface here. The different colors show you the different contributions of scattering from the different components of the scene. So for example, the dark blue is just what you get from the ground only. So if you didn't have the tree, you would just get this dark blue. If you have so this red, is what's called the trunk ground double bounce. So it's what uh, the signal that hits the, the trunk, the ground, and back up. So as, as you go across your observation scenario, you see that you get a peak in the backscattering direction, and then you get a peak in the forward direction. Okay. And these are actually the two directions that we're mostly interested in observing. Your traditional radar just looks at the backscattering direction. The, the signals of opportunity radar, this specular or this forward direction, that's what's uh, important to observe. So again, this, this should just give you an idea of the strength of the signal um, around the target. Now let's get to the soil moisture uh, topic now. So with this background that now we know how to represent a very complex scattering scene in terms of the components, the contribution of different components, what do we do with it? Well, we're going to take our measurements, we're going to take the model, and try to extract these variables in the model based on our measurements. One of the main things, again, going back to the very focus of this talk being soil moisture and water, mapping of surface soil moisture, and when I say surface, I mean just you know, surface and a few centimeters below this, let's say five centimeters or so. That has actually a very long tradition in microwave remote sensing. The decades, I would say, you know, 20, 30 years at least of, um, of history behind mapping soil moisture with microwave sensors. And these are both active and passive. So radars being the active sensors, radiometers being the passive sensors, but these are <clears throat> all microwave. And the, the community has used satellite sensors, airborne sensors, in situ or tower-based sensors to, uh, to look at soil moisture. Uh, however, you know, remember that we need to get a little bit below the surface. We don't want just the surface soil moisture. There's a lot more water below the surface than it is at the surface. So we really need to quantify that. So soil moisture profiles down to the root zone, uh, that, that's a much more recent uh, topic of research. And we know that we need long, long wavelength radar. You know, uh, we already discussed. There's no satellite system yet that can do that. The lowest frequency satellite system uh, civilian that we know of and have used is at L-band. L-band, 1.2 gigahertz, 24 centimeter wavelength. It can penetrate about this much into the surface of the soil. So we don't really have a, a much a longer wavelength sensor to do that, to, to get us to the roots on soil moisture. However, um, we have done airborne demonstrations, and I'm going to spend some time to talk about our airborne demonstrations. So this is really the state of the art. And of course, we have in-situ sensors, but those are used mostly for validation purposes. So before I talk about the root zone soil moisture and going below the surface, let me just show you one example of, um, this is really the state of the art in surface soil moisture mapping. If you guys are familiar with uh, the NASA Soil Moisture Active Passive Mission, or this map, Mission. This is an L-band uh, combined radar and radiometer mission that was launched in uh, 2015. So unfortunately, the radar transmitter failed uh, just a few months after launch. So now we only have the, the passive sensor. But when we had the active sensor, actually, so, and this is an example of, of the active sensor measurements uh, globally. This is just the backscatter measurement, and this is the derived soil moisture product. This is a mean over one month of uh, soil moisture values from SPAP. So we have shown that um, given the right measurement, we can produce the surface soil moisture uh, from radar. So, so this is, uh, again, if we had the sensor, uh, we could do it. Let's go to the long wavelength radar. So this is another sensor that we developed with uh, under the NASA and JPL uh, program called AIRMOS. It stands for Airborne Microwave Observatory of Subcanopy and Subsurface. 
So this is the, the project that I was the lead on, and then we worked with our JPL colleagues to build the radar, and uh, a large group of investigators on the science side uh, who developed products and algorithms for, um, for the sensor. So this is what it looks like. You see, so this is a NASA Gulfstream, one of the NASA Gulfstream um, airplanes. Uh, you see this pod that's hanging from the belly of the airplane? That's the radar. And if you look at it closely, this is the, the pod opened <coughs> up. On the side that you don't see, the side that's pointing away from us, that's the antenna. It's a four element uh, array antenna. <coughs> On the front side, the, one, the side that, that's facing us, that's the actual electronics of the, of the radar. This is a P-band frequency radar. So that's a, um, we operated at 420 to 440 megahertz. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the wavelength then would be about 70 centimeters or so. So imagine 70 centimeters, we expect to get penetration by about maybe not quite 70 centimeters, depending on how much water there is in the soil, but definitely tens of centimeters of penetration. So, and this is the, the view from inside. This is the peaks of the cockpit. This is what the electronic uh, racks look like, uh, workstations for the radar operator, and then for, the, for controlling the, uh, the motion of the aircraft pretty uh, precisely as well. So that, that, this system is the state of the art in uh, PMAN radars. So we took our time. This was a five-year project. So it took us a couple of years to build the radar, and then we flew the instrument about three or four years after that. We're still flying it for uh, many other applications. Uh, but so we covered quite a range of uh, biomes or locations within North America, we, starting from the boreal forest, the way up north in Canada, very cold, uh, down to the tropical forests in, in Central America. And so in a, in a nutshell, this is what we do. We start from the radar imagery. Okay. Uh, the, the slant is basically whichever way the, the orientation of the flight path is. Uh, so we, we collect the data, we send it through this conglomerate, basically the sausage maker, I want to call it. Right? So it, it's, it's that complicated uh, radar scattering model that, that you know, has been developed over the years, includes the vegetation, all the subsurface soil layers, and so forth. We put everything in, and magically on the other side we get maps of soil moisture from the surface. It's a pro profile soil moisture maps that I'll show you in just a minute. And of course, there's many, many unknowns. If, if you really wanted to make every piece of this problem an unknown, it would be impossible to solve because we have you know, many trees, many branches, everything, the moisture content is unknown. All these orientations, the, the lengths, the size, all of these are unknowns. The, the roughness of the surface is unknown. So if you really wanted to treat everything as an unknown, it would be an impossible problem to solve. So we make assumptions. For example, I know that if I'm looking outside, I know basically what those trees look like. So I, I parameterize my model with some knowledge about what's on top, about the vegetation. And I focus the, what, we, uh, what we don't know on the, on the subsurface features. Okay, because that, that's our goal. The soil moisture mapping is our goal. So, and we make assumptions about the profile of soil moisture. We can put any function uh, that you'd like in there. Uh, by looking at a lot of data over, over the years uh, from in situ sites, we, we know that soil moisture behaves something like a quadratic function. In, in, so, well, let me just say that the quadratic function is a very good model most of the time for subsurface variations. But again, this is not unique. We could, we could put any other model that makes sense. So let, let me show you some examples of a couple of those sites. So this is the site right here. Um, in Arizona, it's this arid, semi-arid site. There's some vegetation on top. But the ground surface, it's a desert area. The ground surface is, um, is usually very dry. Okay? And being a desert, you think, OK, it's just dry. So what's the point of even looking at it with this? But here's the surprise. So this is the interesting thing. So by using our sensor, we have found that uh, the the surface is dry, and let me, let me explain these different panels to you, and then I'll make my point. So um, these are all the same area. The horizontal and vertical axes are geographic, longitude and latitude. So 
longitude go, goes this way, latitude that way, and this lens is just a flight path that was flown like that. The length is about 100 kilometers. The width is about 25 kilometers. And the color scale, which is exactly the same for all charts, for all panels, it starts from very dry. Red is dry. Blue is wet. So more water, blue is wet. Red is dry. If you look at the surface soil moisture, very dry. As expected, it's Arizona, it's a desert. Uh, but this is the interesting thing. If you dig just a little bit, and I say dig, this is digging with microwaves. It's kind of a notional uh, digging. And, and we can generate a cross-section map continuously at any depth you, you want. So I've just chosen like four different examples. So you see that as we go deeper and deeper, we just go 75 centimeters, and look at how much water there is. So it's quite wet. A lot of water stored uh, in the soil, even in the desert. And this is the information that we couldn't really have before having this kind of a low frequency radar instrument. So that's one site. Uh, this is, um, well, it's the same site, different date. Let me just go through this fast. And then we've, we've gone through, you know, many other uh, sites. I think actually I have an updated version. I had another, so oh yeah, this is another site I wanted to show you. This is another location. It's in California. Uh, this is just the name, Tonzi Ranch in central California. Similarly, so that's the flight path. Uh, surface soil moisture, 10 centimeters, 30, and 45 centimeters below the surface. And so here, the surface is a little wetter than Arizona was, and then the subsurface is really wet. Again, it, it only takes about 45 centimeters to get to um, nearly saturated soil in that location. It turns out that this location has a hard pan, clay hard pan, at about 50, 60 centimeters. So it makes sense that if you dig a little deeper, you get to pretty saturated soil. So again, uh, nothing that we, we would have expected on a, on a large scale. Uh, we have compared um, our measurements with a lot of in situ sensors just to get confidence, you know, because I could claim something, but you should ask me why. I mean, how, you, how do you know you're right? And the way we know that we are you know, right most of the time is that you know, we've compared our measurements or our retrievals with a lot of in situ ground-based measurements. And uh, just examples here. The blue dots here, these are actual uh, probe in the ground, so they provide the gold standard or benchmark measurements for soil moisture, ground truth. And then the dotted line, this is what we retrieve as our quadratic function for the soil moisture in the subsurface. So we get pretty good accuracy uh, uh, in the sites. And putting everything together, and this is the result of four years of flying, 1,000 flight hours that we've done. So many, many sites, many, many different data takes. And uh, we came up with an assessment of the overall accuracy of our measurements. So going from near the surface to 10, 25, 45, we basically said about 5% accuracy, which, is, uh, which was the goal. We, we wanted to stay to within about 5% uh, or so accuracy. So we have met the objective. And this is um, in terms of the climate, or rather the hydrologic models. And the experts here uh, you know, should correct me if I'm wrong. But Having accuracy of about 5% or 0.05 volumetric soil moisture is what the hydrologic community has accepted as, as, the, as a good goal for their model. And then more recently, we are applying the same techniques, moving up north. Uh, think about Alaska, the Arctic. It, it, we are here in a climate which is quite away from the Arctic. But uh, we should keep in mind that the effects of global warming are actually being felt twice as fast in the Arctic regions than anywhere else in the world. So it's warming up at twice the rate as anywhere else. So there's a big issue up there having to do with, uh, well, among other things, permafrost melting. Permafrost is a soil that stays frozen more than two years in a row. Uh, but a lot of the observations from in situ sensors are telling us that the permafrost, which is you know, below the surface, that it's receding. So we're losing frozen ground year after year. And it varies you know, across the Arctic. And so we have, we have flown our radar instrument, this AirMOS T-MAN instrument, around Alaska many times. And from that, we have generated maps of both soil moisture and uh, depth of thaw. So we can, with this radar, we can estimate how much uh, uh, this permafrost is thawing uh, year over year. So now we have three years' worth of data. And the jury's still out in some locations we see that the depth is increasing. Some locations are staying um, 
uh, stable, but overall the, the trend seems to be towards uh, melting. So th this has also been eye-opening. So I think uh, I could spend a couple minutes quickly just uh, uh, showing this chart again. So I don't know if you remember this or not. This is a signal of opportunity uh, concept here. The idea is that um, you know, all these you know, big, uh, expensive radar missions and instruments aside, which are great and we always need them, we do need, and I, I really do believe this uh, from a water resource perspective, we need other sensors that are more ubiquitous, more accessible, and less expensive to operate that, that would allow us to measure soil moisture, groundwater, stuff like that, on a much more continuous and pervasive basis. And that's where these signals of opportunity come in. So let's say if all of us in our backyards had a receiver, could receive GPS signals and everyone reported their signals or their measurements to some uniform database, we would have a global, uh, global data database of all these measurements without too much effort. So this is something that I think overall, long term, we should be striving for. Let me skip that because I don't think I have time for that. Um, let me also just uh, show you a couple of things about groundwater mapping. I've focused on soil moisture, uh, but also another thing we're looking at is groundwater. And groundwater actually is going to be even tougher to get to because it's deeper. We need even lower frequencies to get to groundwater. But it's really important because the groundwater worldwide is being depleted. It's somewhat out of necessity because we need to f grow food. Uh, the climate is becoming warmer and drier. So otherwise, fresh water is less accessible. So you can't blame the farmers for you know, drawing water. The, the problem is that we don't really have a good way of monitoring who's drawing groundwater and how much, and whether they're using it effectively or not. So having some kind of an information that could close the loop, not to stop people from doing, but at least do it in a, in a rational way, uh, it's really important. So that's why we really need to come up with technologies to quantify and track groundwater. We know that it has to be some kind of a long wavelength radar, even longer wavelength, sounders. And sounders, as you know, you know, well, you know we, we've sent sounders to Mars. We could do it for Earth, or so, some version of that we should and could do on Earth. And one thing that in the absence of large you know, space agency missions <clears throat> right now, one thing that we could do is to come up with send, uh, in situ networks of low groundwater detectors. So this is something that we are working on right now. We are building small GPRs, ground penetrating radars, which we plan to deploy as a network. Uh, and by deploying the, these as a network, then we can generate maps of uh, groundwater. Uh, and then our vision going forward is that we are going to mount these small radars on small UAVs and form networks of UAVs that can fly on demand. And groundwater is not something that changes very fast, so we don't need to be monitoring all the time. We could do it once a year, we could do it once every six months, but we could have, you know, in, in hot spots where we know groundwater is being depleted, this is um, really the idea going forward. So with that, let me um, summarize my talk by emphasizing that uh, microwave remote sensing technologies at frequencies of about one, let's say two gigahertz and below. This is what we need to track uh, stuff that goes on below the surface, the ground, the soil moisture, groundwater. This is what we really need. Oops, sorry. Uh, conventional backside radars are highly capable. We need them. We can't do without them. But we also uh, need to be looking at other methods, other other modalities such as signals of opportunity, uh, where we use existing signals to to make our mapping. Um, we also need to do in situ sensors, obviously, and, and sensor networks, especially keeping in mind that the, the UAV-based sensor networks. Uh, the idea also here um, that I hope I have uh, at least tried to convey, especially to our younger energetic generation with new and fresh ideas, is that there's a lot of interesting research topics that can be explored in this area. There's, there's you know, something in this for everybody. You could be on the technology side and the instrument development side. There's a lot of interesting work there, spaceborne, airborne sensors, UAVs, all that. There's a lot of signal processing and computational methods that are needed. 
uh, if you're into physics-based modeling, that's really uh, another uh, needed area of expertise. And ultimately, we are, as technologists and engineers or remote sensing scientists, we are in the business of providing useful information to modelers. Uh, people who have hydrologic models, ecological models, these, these scientists are the ones who are the end users of our data, so we have, we have the responsibility to provide um, high quality, reliable, and continuous data sets to such models so that they can close the loop and try to solve things like the water puzzle. So with that, I'll stop and take your questions. You must have some questions. Uh, currently, like uh, as you see, uh, SMAP operational alpine radiometer uh, radar is there that was failed. So uh, basically, that uh, operational algorithm was based on some numerical models. Correct. But a lot of uncertainty is available. Uh, already, it is there in the models. Like uh, to, uh, you, as uh, you explained, that a uh, lot of uh, input parameters are required for the retrieval purpose. Exactly. So how much you prefer the uh, retrieval of soil moisture using physical models? Instead of physical models, we can have some other methods which can be more operational in sense and easy to implement. That is the first question. Right, right. And second is question is regarding the in situ sensor and uh, sensor networks. Because the most challenging part what I am facing is that validation of satellite soil moisture derived product actually. Because we have uh, from radi radiometer we have a kilometer scale soil moisture yes. and from radar we have a meter scale. So how to optimize the number of sensors within a uh, within a scale right. uh, that depending on the topography, land covers, land use, land covers, and different types of soil texture. So how to optimize very that? Very good, that yes. Well. So very good questions. And actually, I probably have one whole presentation for each of your questions. <laughs> so you know, I, I'd be happy to, you know, next time you know, uh, uh, there's an opportunity to, to give you a much more extended answer. But let me address each of your questions at least briefly. So the first question about the algorithms. So SMAP, as you mentioned, um, actually I was very much involved with developing the, the SMAP uh, retrieval algorithms for the radar, uh, which unfortunately, you know, the, the radar <laughs> failed. So, but we did develop the whole operation, operational version of the algorithm. So that mission was, the, the retrieval was based on what we call data cubes. So we had exactly the same model that I uh, talked about here, so the, the full electromagnetic scattering model. But what we did was that we ran the model uh, through a large uh, range of different parameters. And the parameters that we chose were soil moisture, of course, surface roughness, and what we call the vegetation water content, which is kind of a, a lump representation of, uh, of the vegetation. Uh, depending on the structure and you know, the uh, moisture content of vegetation, you get different amounts of vegetation water content. But in any case, we generated these multidimensional data cubes, and uh, the operational algorithm, what it did was it, it searched through the data cube for the best match with the observation. And it was a, a multi-polarization, so we had the, uh, the copal polarizations. Well, we had three polarizations, but we mostly were planning to use two of the polarizations, but it was multiple polarizations anyway. So yeah, so the algorithm just picked the best match of those polarizations from the data cube with the, the radar measurements. So that was that, but as you said, these are very approximate. So there's, there are large er error bars associated that in fact, um, one of the papers that, the, the, uh, the, that we published through the SMAP mission, it shows that we reach an accuracy of about 6% soil moisture, or 0.06 volumetric soil moisture. Uh, you know, going forward, yes, I mean, we, we must, address the problem, I, I do believe we need to address it a little differently. You know, we were earlier talking about machine learning methods and eventually that it makes sense to combine our physics-based models with more data-based models. I don't think either one is going to be the full answer in the long run. We need both things to be merged, but we can inform the physics-based model uh, with uh, database learning, deep learning type of methods so that at least wh where we start, our, um, our retrieval, its iterative schemes, we started from a good place. 
through the machine learning. So we start, it's, it, it becomes kind of a handshake between the, the learning methods and the physics-based method. So that's that. Now in terms of the in-situ sensors, and that's another thing actually I was involved, I am still involved with, with this MAP project and for other uh, projects as well. As you mentioned, some of these satellite sensors have large footprints. Uh, so let's say if you have a kilometer, two kilometer, and SMAP has 36 kilometer now, the radiometer footprint. If you're looking at soil moisture, soil moisture actually changes on meter level scales. It could change at meter level scales. So if you report one number over a few kilometer footprint, it really, you know, it, what does that mean? And how do we validate? How do we know we've measured the, the correct thing? I guess one metric is the average. If, if you just calculate the mean, over an area and you compare it with what the satellite measures, that, that's, I think that's the most accepted way of doing a comparison. The question is how do you generate that mean? And that's where the in-situ sensor networks come in. Um, and that itself, again, I can give you another talk completely on that, on the in-situ sensor network. That's right, we, uh, very good, yes, yes, exactly. We, we have the soil scale. That's right, so you could do, exactly, you're right. Uh, that you, by doing all these, we've done a lot of numerical experiments to optimize uh, the, 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 the placement of the sensors and, and what weight is given to which one. Because I'm constructing all these different geospatial data, data layers, including topography, land cover type, soil texture, uh, all these things. Uh, so you make some kind of stratification representation of your measurements and then from that, you can come up with the, base, uh, with the best arrangement of where the sensor should be. So, very good questions, thank you. Yes? How soil salinity affected the moisture estimation? Mm. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, so, you know, the radars, all these microwave sensors are, you know, when I say that they're sensitive to water, what I really mean is that they're sensitive to dielectric constant or permittivity. And one of, so the main impact on dielectric constant is water. And another very influential factor is salinity. And other things like uh, soil texture, for example, how much you know, uh, silt or clay and sand content there is. So, uh, so yes, I mean, your question is definitely a good one in the sense that salinity could very much impact our, uh, the accuracy of our estimates of soil moisture because we use when we run our electromagnetics models, we basically get uh, dielectric constants. And then we use another set of models to convert dielectric constant to soil moisture. So salinity is one of the factors that goes into uh, that conversion from dielectric constant to soil moisture. So if, if we have the wrong value or a bad estimate or if we don't include it, we could be committing a large error in the soil moisture estimates. And by the same token, it could be an information that we can retrieve. So in some areas, sort of salinity is what people want to know. So if you can make assumptions about some other things, so if, if you know what the soil moisture is, then maybe you can estimate salinity. So. Is cost a factor while optimizing the web of sensors for in situ measurements? Is cost a factor? Cost is a factor. Um, and most of it is human cost because it, it's manually intensive to deploy these sensors. Uh, you know, by now, you know, the, the soilscape network that we have developed, the actual hardware, we are reaching a, a pretty good, stable uh, version. Of course, you know, we, we keep tweaking and optimizing it more and more. But in terms of the design, the, the electronics and so forth, we are you know, getting a pr pretty stable place where we're not putting as much uh, effort or, or money into the development. But deployment right now is really the main cost. Uh, but I would say that um, it's, it, I mean, in the big scheme of things, it's a very small cost. I mean, we launch a billion dollar satellites. Right? So if we spend you know, $100,000 on deploying a very you know, capable network on the ground, it's really not a, a big, uh, big cost to pay. Hello ma'am, I am a student of MTech Geomatics from SEPT University and uh, my question is, uh, is soil moisture content uh, is dynamic with uh, respect to evaporation, time and season? Absolutely. 
Absolutely, yes. And that's why, for example, you see missions like SMAP uh, having a very fast repeat observation cycle. So SMAP has a three-day observation cycle. Uh, I mean, people would probably want even more frequent than that. So definitely the answer is yes, there's large dynamics around soil moisture. And uh, so ma'am, uh, if it is a uh, very dynamic uh, thing, so can we uh, extract the rate of uh, evaporation uh, of a particular place mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, then can we predict how the soil moisture content is changing? Right, right. right. So I think that's one of the, um, uh, what do you call it? It's one of the holy grails in, again, I don't want to sound like a hydrologist. I, I don't mean to uh, intrude in that category, but I, I learned a little bit from interacting with hydrologists. But closing, closing this, um, uh, this relationship, the evapor evapotranspiration recharge, I think that is one of the major unknowns in hydrology. And, and that's one of the reasons we really need to get our hands on the roots on soil moisture. Uh, not just the surface, but the root zone, because there's a lot of memory in the soil deep down, and we need to bring that in, in into that closure uh, relationship. And I, I do believe the answer to your question is yes, that yes, I think we can do it, but we need observations uh, more frequently and in more places. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. Sounder, radar yes, sounders. Right. So, what frequency are aiming for? Those are going to be lower frequency. Uh, it is megahertz. Uh, uh, or maybe ten, tens of megahertz is what we're going for. I mean, right now we have a prototype that is a couple hundred megahertz. So, it would be like a uh, air coupled GPR kind of thing. Air coupled GPR. It's uh, so the way we are building these. These are going to be installed in situ. Okay. So they're they're just slightly below the surface because we want to get rid of that air interface. So it's as though we're installing in situ sensors, like your standard, like uh, you know, you, you know the Stevens hydroprobe stuff yeah, like that, right? Yeah. So the, those the, those make contact with the soil, and our new GPR nodes are also the same way, except that so we we bury them very shallow, and then they're able to send the signal and receive it back. So it, that's why we call it in situ GPR. Oh, oh you say pulse radar kind of thing, GPR. Pulse yes, radar. that's right. Uh, so I don't have a question. I would just like to know that as an applied scientist, if there were some pressing issues apart from what you've mentioned here, what would those areas of research be to solve this groundwater puzzle using SAR technology? If, if that's something I, my students would want to take up, mm. what would those pressing issues be which they could take up as areas of research? Right, so there, there is the technology aspect in terms of hardware systems, and then there is the analysis side, and they're both challenges. Uh, on the technology side, if you want to build these low frequency radars that can penetrate deep and launch them in space, there are limitations with that because the lower frequencies are impacted by the ionosphere. So there's, there's some issue to deal with from that perspective. And that's yet another reason that I think these, that these in situ flying networks, those ultimately might be the way we do the groundwater mapping. You want to, again, given that they don't really change, satellite systems are good when you have huge dynamics. You want to observe something over and over again. Uh, and for groundwater, of course, I mean, it's, it's great to have something that can address that from a satellite. But given the, the challenges, technological challenges, it might be more reasonable, at least in the shorter term, being like the next 10 years or so, just to confine ourselves to lower uh, altitudes. But there's a lot of technology development that still needs to to happen. In terms of the analyses, um, we need to improve the, the computational efficiency of our algorithms. The physics are relatively well known. It's basically captured in the first three slides <laughs> that I you know was showing in, the, in terms of how the signal interactions go, but implementing them in computations and then going to this data-based um, anal analytics, uh, learning methods. I mean, as as a radar engineer who you know, was really on the tech, you know, I consider myself a lot on the technology side, also on the analysis side. I'm becoming a bit of a convert into these learning and deep learning methods, even though you know, you know, a lot of computer scientists may want to claim that. But for us, on the physics side, actually, it turns out we can learn a lot by just staring at a time series of data 
for a long time. I think we can learn quite a bit from that. So I, I do think that that's a, that's a really interesting uh, direction for us to go in. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think we are running a little short of time, so uh, I request Dr. Shiv Mohan to give away a small. Uh, ma'am and Dr. Shiv Mohan, please, a small uh, memento as a memory from the, all the organizers. Thank you and uh